Good morning, everyone. I am really excited to uh, do episode two of Foundations of Grace this morning with you all. I just bear with me a second while I invite Brooke to this. Press this button here. Oops, that's not the button. See, I'm learning this. I'm learning it as we go. Let's check. Yep, just bear with me. So hopefully that sent and uh, she'll be on here in a minute. So last week, I just wanted to say really quickly, uh, last week I did notice a little bit. Um, so... Oh, there, there we go. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing pretty well. I'm excited about today's episode. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to go through. <laughs> so much to unpack. So... To begin, um, did you want to, um, should we start with like a recap a little bit of what we talked about last week? Yeah, I think so. Like I was thinking, um, yeah, we can recap a bit and because, um, the devil or Satan is kind of like, we want to maybe get that out of the way. We can kind of like bang off a few things about Satan first and then sort of move into the Cain and Abel story. And then I was thinking we could kind of finish up with the sin stuff because that seems to... That seems there's a lot of meat on the sin part because we're talking about sin originally and then sin on this side of the cross. So I think that's kind of like a nice segue into the comment section. I think so too. Okay. So I'll give, I'll tell you what, I'll give a little bit of a brief, let me find it here, just a little bit of a brief um, recap on like the breath of life stuff that we talked about last week. And then okay. start, I guess we'll start there and just kind of go from there. So let me, it's so funny. I, I always say this, but every time I do these live streams, I prepare for them and then I get in here and like my windows are in the wrong place. But okay. So last week in a nutshell, what we were talking about is we're talking about life and what life was and how life is this exclusive thing that it comes from God and it doesn't come from anywhere else. And we presented the state that earth is in. It's kind of a proof of that. Just look at earth. I mean, it's dead. It's dark. There's nothing alive there from pole to pole. God comes down and he has to actually, he brings life with him. So in a lot of ways, life is this, it's this alien visitor to earth. It's just something foreign, something that's not earth. We're talking about that a lot. And then we're talking about the construction of Adam. And when God actually builds Adam, he builds him out of clay or dust, but probably clay. He builds him out of earth's physical matter. And he actually breathes life into Adam. And I think that's something that we, you know, we're all really familiar with the breath of life. You know, I think that's something that does get a lot of time. A lot of a lot of time talked about at the pulpit and all of that, but we, we took a little bit of a deeper approach, and we were talking about how the breath of life is an exhale from the Holy Spirit. It's a single breath from God, and that single breath was enough to animate all of humanity for all of time, and that's a testament to how much life is actually in God. He it is life, essentially. Life only comes from him. He has so much life in him. And that being said, I think it made a lot more sense as to why us who received the fullness of God, the Holy Spirit— how we would live forever we would have eternal life how could it be anything beyond that if a breath of life is enough for all people for all time a single breath then certainly the fullness of god would be enough for an eternity so um the next facet of this was that the life that god gave to adam is only was only ever given to adam and what i mean by that is we never have another instance of god breathing life into a person it happens one time it happened in the beginning with adam Adam then, Eve is built out of Adam's spare parts. She's built out of his rib, and she is never given her own breath of life because she doesn't need it. It's transferable. It moves from one person to the other. So Eve has Adam's life. Another way of saying that would be that Eve is in Adam. And that's really important, and it helps us understand, when we get to the New Testament, it helps us understand a lot of things with us being in Christ. So then we fast forwarded a little bit to where Eve actually, you know, we have the also famous conversation between her and the serpent at the tree, and he convinces Eve to, hey, why don't, you, why don't you give this tree a try? Why don't you, you know, all that? And she does do it. She eats from the tree. And what we were trying to highlight there is absolutely nothing happens. She eats from the tree and nothing happens. And that's very important because it helps us knowing her construction and knowing that she has Adam's life and that she's in Adam, I think helps us understand on this side of the cross how it works with us being in Christ. Um, Eve sins and nothing happens. Because her righteousness and her life are not her own. They're actually from Adam. It would have to be Adam that would sin in order for her to become corrupted. And of course, eventually that's what happens. Eve could have eaten every piece of fruit on the, fruit on the tree. 
and nothing would have ever happened to her ever because it wasn't up to her. It was up to Adam. So, and this, I think, is that kind of where we left it? Yeah, absolutely. Like we, um, yeah, we cut off just before kind of going into how sin transferred over. Like, I think today we're going to kind of carry that vehicle along to how sin transferred from that first generation or how it entered through that first generation and sort of magnified as it went along. And I know you and I talked about what we're going to discuss a little bit about how, um, sin's impact on Cain versus Eve. Uh, an interesting thing though, that I was, and I know we're, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. I was reading it the second book of Enoch, but that we could be here for 12 hours if we go into that, but something very interesting, something really cool pertaining to this story that um, is interesting to note is that it says, so the devil seduced Eve and entered her as sort of a vehicle to carry that seed of doubt over to Adam. So he could not, it's important to note that he couldn't enter Adam. Like Adam is this divine seal, but Eve created from Adam. He was able to enter enter and seduce her knowing that she would carry this thought over to Adam. So she would create the seed of doubt in Adam's mind. So the devil couldn't penetrate Adam in any way, but as we know, anything that is not of faith is sin. So as long as she can cast that seed of doubt in Adam's mind and sort of start to unravel this sealed up faith that he has in God, that's where it starts, right? That's where, that's the seed that sort of, I imagine it is like a seed that's germinating and it's like, once you hit that seed of doubt, it can start to grow. But it's it's just really interesting to see that he needed Eve, he needed to seduce her and to enter her so she could kind of be this vehicle over to Adam to cast that, just that little bit of doubt from the faith that he had in God. And did you say the second book of Enoch says that? Yeah, so whatever the um, loosely whatever translation that we get in English. <laughs> so, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. But I think just that distinction was really interesting. Mm -hmm. The way it's, and it, and it makes sense because Adam is this divine seal. Like Satan couldn't necessarily go and enter him. He had to, he needed a vehicle. He needed Eve to kind of be that vehicle to cast that vote. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't know that's, that's fascinating. I didn't know that the books of Enoch spoke about the Garden of Eden at all. So no, I didn't either. I just like, I, I needed the uh, Apicropa to kind of do some work here. And I was just kind of flipping through it. And then I see this passage where it's speaking specifically about that. I'm like, well, I certainly don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but that just that in itself is a really cool distinction. I think mm -hmm. it's one of those things where like the Apocrypha actually throws some context onto scripture a little bit. And it, it, it shows in, you know, I know there's all, it's like hotly contested whether or not Enoch actually wrote the books of Enoch, but, um, if he did, it seems like he understood what happened in the Garden of Eden a little bit, maybe better than we have today. You know, like today it's kind of a, well, I, I think there's so many details. Like, like in other kind of yeah. in the series, I mean, there's so many details that get like looked over, but it seems well, like maybe, I, go ahead. Sorry, and I just going to say, I kind of like this perspective because it actually lines up really well with how we see sin sort of growing. Like as we look at Cain, down to Lamech, which I know we'll go into, but you see ignorance growing. Sin is sort of, it's the ignorance of God. We, mm -hmm. we start being, God creates us to be very good. As he said, we're very good. And then it sort of unravels from there and the ignorance starts to grow. The independence from God starts to grow. So it makes a lot of sense that it would be, you know, just the doubt, the lack of faith, like the unraveling of faith as we go down the generations, because by the time you get to Lamech, you have him, you know, boasting about his independence from God. So mm -hmm. it's just really cool to see how, not that the sin is cool, but it's cool to see how it grew with those, at least those first seven generations with what started as this perfect seal of faith in God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It's fascinating. Kind of like follow the kind of pull the thread basically and follow sin through the generations so we i think we got all that so i guess what um what maybe should we talk about the devil a little bit before we talk about sin to kind of like differentiate those two if that's the right word for it yeah i feel like we uh we don't want to give him too much attention but we have to get him out of the way so let's like cover off some points about Satan. right yeah yeah uh-huh 
And I think that when we talked about this a little earlier in the week, I think that that is kind of where, to me, I feel like the Garden of Eden story goes wrong, is when we put so much emphasis on the serpent. And the serpent almost conceals what the greater problem is, which is sin. There, I think if you make like any sort of a thumbs up gesture, that happens. So I'll have to not do that. But um, I think the serpent kind of is in the way of that. He's kind of like concealing the, the greater the greater villain, essentially, which is sin. So a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll throw out a little bit about the serpent, and then uh, we kind of, I guess, just go back and forth on Linus. But yeah. the serpent, Genesis actually never says that the serpent is the devil. That's not in Genesis. It's really not in the Old Testament. The understanding that this serpent was some kind of a manifestation of this Satan creature that shows up later almost exclusively, and I think actually exclusively, comes from from Revelation, uh, where the, the Satan and the serpent are referred to as the same. Uh, I think in a sentence, John says something about Satan. He says that ancient serpent who is the devil. So he kind of throws them all into one sentence, and that's really where we get that. But as far as the Old Testament, either Moses didn't know when he wrote Genesis, or he didn't think it was relevant, or however that went, but he never actually attributes the serpent creature to being the devil. So that's that's more of a recent revelation. I, I throw that in just because I think it's interesting. Um, I think that in our in our teachings, we've always said that this is the devil, and it, it's, it seems to be. But that came, that knowledge came much later. That that was something that came along much later. That understanding, building building on on that a little bit. I want to read something here, kind of kind of quickly. So, what we hear about the devil, you know, where did where did this guy come from? Who is he? All those things. I'm going to read a little bit of a excerpt. It's really short, and tell me if this sounds familiar. Okay. So, here's where do I start this? Okay. So, there was an angel. His name was Lucifer, whom God made more beautiful than all the other angels. Lucifer became obsessed with his own beauty and began to lust for power, seeking to raise his throne above God. He eventually leads an insurrection in the heavenly places and convinces a third of God's angels to join him in an ill-fated quest for the crown. After a three-day war, Lucifer and his followers are single-handedly defeated by the Son of God and thrown to earth. Vowing revenge, Lucifer makes it his mission to corrupt the newly created Adam and Eve. Some elements of that may sound familiar. Does some elements of that sound familiar? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's actually from a book. It's from 1667 called Paradise Lost. And that book is by John Milton. And that is actually where we get our devil origin story from, primarily. It's from an extra biblical fiction book. The reason I bring this up is because in scripture, there is no angel named Lucifer who becomes lustful for power and decides... You'll hear different variations of this. Like some of them, it's like he he wants to be God, or he's you know whatever. He becomes arrogant, become because of his beauty, things like that. But no such story exists anywhere in Scripture. There was never such a person named Lucifer. This never happened. This all comes from Paradise Lost. So, yeah, and it's funny because I've I've never read that book, but growing up, that was exactly what I thought it was. Is like this is factual. This is what happened, and I have no idea. Who or what planted that seed in my mind, but that's exactly what I thought it was. Yep. 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 Me too. And I was, I don't know about you, but I was flabbergasted when I found out that that was not actually in scripture. So I, I remember even as recent as last year, I was listening to a pastor and he's talking all about the angel Lucifer. And I was like, the, the who? The what? This, this person that doesn't exist? So, I mean, so if that's not it, then what is it? I mean, like, what what is the devil origin story, I guess, would be my question. I mean, do we have anything in scripture that talks about, like, a where this person, this thing, whatever he is, came from? Uh, see, I, and based on what I'm looking at, it seems to me that no one, nothing in the Hebrew Bible indicates to me that we have an actual origin story. Like, it, it's interesting with the word Satan, because I'm seeing that, Satan is used in a lot of different ways. And we talked about when we were kind of brainstorming the way sin is used synonymously with death, although it's not the same thing. It's used synonymously. Like we have Romans 5, 12, whereas we know sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And this way death came to all people because all sin. But then if you look at the wisdom of Solomon, it's very similar. He says through the devil's envy, death entered the world. So He's using sin kind of synonymous 
with death. And then I was kind of looking at, okay, well, what about Satan? Like, how is Satan used? And as it turns out, all of the references to the word Satan in the Old Testament, with the exception of one, are used as just a non-technical meaning. Like, meaning it's actually used as a verb or or just a title, not a proper noun. It's only used once as his actual name. So mm -hmm. it's anything that's an adversary is to Satan. So it's used as a verb, which is kind of interesting. Like in the, they have Hasatan, which is the Satan. So it's just, you know, not Satan as the creature that we in English speak of him as, but just the mm -hmm. Satan, that, that which opposes God. Um, and it's, it's interesting how that word is used as a verb throughout. Like even um, in Numbers 2.22, the messenger of the Lord stood in the way of Balaam as his Satan meaning as his adversary. So anything that's an adversary, so it could be a celestial being or a human being. So it's actually used more as a verb in the Old Testament than it is as the creature Satan that we all think of him as. So there's positive uses of the word Satan. Yeah, like David was, they used to refer to David as the Satan, as the adversary because of that which he opposed, even though he was after the, the Lord's heart, he was called the Satan or he, or the verb Satan, because he was just, whoever is an adversary was called the Satan. It's so fascinating. Can, can you imagine if you taught that in like s certain churches that David is actually referred to as the Satan in some, some portions of scripture? That's oh, you'd be thrown out for sure. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that is so fascinating. So I didn't know that. I, I knew a little bit, like I knew Satan was like the adversary, like in Hebrew, but I didn't, I never knew there were positive uses. Of it. So that's, that's a whole nother facet. I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah. So when you see that it's used more as a verb than as the actual name of this creature that we all have in our mind in English, you see that they probably, it's likely that they didn't really have a good origin story for this guy because they're just using that word all over the place as something that's opposing something else not, not even necessarily something that opposes god just an adversary of anything is called the satan mm -hmm. so it's just interesting how that word is thrown around in a lot of different ways yeah i think that's a that's a fantastic point if they had an origin story they would probably be a lot more specific with this person and they probably wouldn't just call him the adversary or the satan that would be whatever his name is and we know exactly who this guy is and where it comes from and everything you know there'd, there'd be like more context to it but so it's kind of a, it's not so much of an official title as we use it as. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, just, it leads me to believe that they're kind of in the same boat that we are now. It's sort of just not really sure, but we know it's something that opposes something else. That's mm -hmm. I, that's based on what I gather. I think that's as far as they got to in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, I think so. In, in kind of bouncing a little bit over to what, where did we come up with Lucifer from? Like, wh where is that and why is that? It actually is from Isaiah 14, but only in the King James Version. Uh, most modern versions have removed that. Why that word is in there, it's it's this lament uh, that is spoken toward the king of Babylon. And it's talking about the upcoming fall of the king of Babylon. And God speaking through Isaiah refers to him as Lucifer in the KJV only. The reason for that word being in the KJV is for the Old Testament scriptures, the KJV was heavily based on what was called the Latin Vulgate. And Lucifer is actually the Latin word for the planet Venus. And in Babylonian mythology, there was a story about the planet Venus. It was referred to as the morning star or the or the day star, things like that. And most of our updated translations will actually say morning star or day star there. The, the story was that the day star, the morning star of Venus or Lucifer was a fallen god who had become prideful in his heart and tried to raise his throne above the top God. And it wasn't, it wasn't Yahweh or anything. It was the Babylonian gods, mm -hmm. but he had tried to raise his throne above this, this, this higher God. And he had been thrown down to the earth. And that was his story, which sounds an awful lot like our double origin story. So we've even mixed some paganism in with that, which isn't surprising. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, not at all. But that's the story. This Lucifer character or Zenus or morning star or day star. So when God is using that parallel, he's talking up, he's using Babylonian literature. He's talking to the king of Babylon and he's saying, just like in your myths, when you had that God try to become God, um, he says, you're not a God, but you're a man. He says that to the king of Babylon. 
he's he's drawing parallel literature there. It's parallel literature to a, a Babylonian myth. And there's actually a lot of things like that in scripture that will reference uh, myths and legends of the cultures. Even the New Testament quotes pagan philosophers several times, yeah. particularly Paul likes quoting pagan philosophers. So that's not uncommon to see that in scripture, to see God use parallel literature or uh, the Holy Spirit or one of the authors use something like that. But that's why Lucifer is in there. It's because it's the Latin, it's the Latin translation of Venus, day star, morning star. It has never, ever, ever been a personal name to attribute to some kind of an angel that that this was about. And that's that's pretty much it. I mean, other than that, I don't think we have an official origin story. I know Ezekiel twenty eight gets thrown, gets mentioned sometimes as well. This was the devil, but um, kind of like Isaiah fourteen, when you start really digging into it, it doesn't seem like it's the devil. I understand why some folks might say that, but um, I believe Ezekiel 28 is actually talking about Adam. That's the scripture where you get the seal of perfection. Yeah. Um, when he says you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, but then you have this seal fall and he's, you know, he's destroyed. And to me, there's a lot of problems with that. I don't know why the devil would be the seal of perfection. Uh, I, I think that's, um, yeah, because that's, for Ezekiel 28, that's exactly what I had heard before. And I feel like the only place that could come from is once people sort of have this mythological origin story in their mind about Lucifer being beautiful and, you know, being favored above all other angels and then he falls, your mind automatically goes there when you see this. You think it's it's God talking about this amazing, beautiful angel that he created that just fell and, oh, it's such a shame. And, and that's automatically where your mind goes, because that's exactly where my mind went when I read that originally. But I, it's such a shame. I think, I honestly, I think most of us probably have this Lucifer origin story in our mind. And I know, quite honestly, like the Catholic Church uses that a lot. They, and I mean, the Latin Vulgate, that makes sense. But um, so it's, it's just, it's been spread around and we don't talk about it in church. We don't, we don't debunk this stuff ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's not a lot of tolerance to it. If you bring up a alternate viewpoint, okay, hang on, you know, maybe you know Lucifer, you know, let's let's examine that. That comes from the KJV. You know, if you bring stuff like that up, it's just like that's almost seen. I had it personally. I had it happen. I did a video on this about a year ago, but that's almost seen as like essential doctrine. This this devil origin story that largely it comes from Babylonian paganism. It comes from Par Paradise Lost. It doesn't come from Scripture, but. Um, it's, it seems like core doctrine, and if that's wrong, you know, it's like they almost kind of equivalent that to like, well, the whole thing's wrong, you know, then so we can't, we have to, we have to preserve this. This is something we've taught for so many years. All of our, you know, the church leaders believed in this. So the devil's name was Lucifer. He was a prideful angel, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we're, we're sticking with it, you know. Yeah, and it's old, so you, you don't touch it, right? Because everything that's old is true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's old. And uh, the last bit of that myth I wanted to mention is there's this idea that the devil took a third of God's angels with him right. during some kind of heavenly insurrection. That is never mentioned anywhere in scripture. It's likely that demonic creatures are angels. There's lots of scriptures that talk about, like, for example, the devil and his angels. Jesus says that when he's talking about the eternal fire. Yeah. It's likely they could be, especially if we do read the books of Enoch, where you kind of see that a little bit. You see, like, trouble in the heavenly places and... Um, I don't, I haven't read them in a long time. I remember there was like a group called the watchers or something like that. There were like yeah. great angels, essentially there, you know, all kinds of different things happen there, but you, you kind of see that a little bit in those books. So it's likely that these demonic creatures are angels. Jesus at least referred to them that way. But as far as the devil turning a third of the angels on God and leading some heavenly rebellion or whatever the paradise lost version of that is no scripture, none that, that says that. I think it's Revelation 12 that mentions the dragon, who is the devil. He's referred to that way, swiping his tail and knocking a third of the stars out of the sky. That's it. That's that's where that comes from, that image. But yeah. I don't think that's enough. I don't, I don't know about you, Brooke, but like to me, it's like, I don't, I don't think that's enough. It's symbolic of something. But yeah, it's sure. sort of like, it's very reminiscent of the John Darby and the seven-year tribulation thing. Like, that's... That's exactly what it is. Like growing up, they, they, I mean, they've made so many different left behind movies at this point. And when I was young in youth group, we used to watch them a lot and it just, it got stuck in your mind, just like you grow up and this stuff gets stuck in your mind. So it's, it's actually shocking how many years you carry this stuff around with you. And then you look 
in scripture, like as if you couldn't have looked before, but you just never do. <laughs> and you were like, oh, a lot of, like, that's not in there. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think officially, like all this being said, I think officially the devil's a bit of an enigma as far as where, where he comes from, what exactly he is. He could be an angelic being. It, it could be that. Uh, Paul says the devil masquerades as an angel of light. He could be that. But as far as is he that, can we say that concretely? Probably not, because we just really don't have that in Scripture. It's likely. It makes sense to me, but I don't know. I mean, that's it's, there's a bit of a mystery. Yeah, and I kind of take that, you know, masquerading as an angel of light is a bit symbolically like, yeah, of course he would in order to be deceptive, right? Because the devil can't really come and show you all of his cards or you won't listen to him. So there's there's got to be an element of deception there, something that, and we see that in the world. We see things that look like peace and things that look good and things that look like love that we know ultimately are not. So that's what I get from that. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think that's really the extent of it. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you on that. It could be symbolic. Like, you know, he could just be mass setting his angel light could mean a lot of different things. And maybe perhaps it's not a, mean he's actually presenting himself to be an angel or something. Like that. you know, that's the more literal version, but it might not be there. So, okay. So that, that takes care of the devil. So we just wanted to say that because we're going to start talking about sin and what sin is and how sin enters the world and things like that. And I think it was our goal to kind of separate sin from the devil and say the devil is not sin. You know, the devil is not the sin that entered the world. There's actually something much different there that's referred to as the sin, this power of sin. It's not the devil. I actually raised this, and I'm not, this is just a thought that I've had for a while, and I'm not 100% like sold on this yet, but to me, it almost seems like the devil himself, he's like a um, he's like a Trojan horse for sin. You know, he, he is that, he's kind of that vehicle that sin gets a mouthpiece and gets to speak to Eve, essentially. Uh, it's also a little bit my opinion that the devil, whatever he may be, seems to be somebody who has actually fallen prey to this power of sin once upon a time. And he's now experiencing the death that comes with it, that separation from God. Um, Jesus says, and I don't know if this scripture works perfectly, like I said, I'm not 100% sold on this, but Jesus says anyone who sins is a slave to sin. He does say that. And the devil, of he also says in that same book that the devil has been sinning since the beginning. So, yeah. He, he says both those things. Now, like I said, I don't know if the theology is perfect on that. But does that, does that sound like something that's plausible? Like, could the devil have actually fallen prey to this power of sin at some point? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in terms of him falling prey to the sin, I think part of that maybe has to do with the fact, like, his, his envy towards humanity, right? Like, there are unbelievers, but we all have the ability to repent of our unbelief and to be reconciled with Christ. And the devil, knowing that he does not have this opportunity, that he's already been condemned, there's nothing There's nothing left for him, right? So it's sort of whether he chooses to kind of marinate in this sin and just fall prey to it, It's there's nothing else for him. So it seems to me, well, he might as well try and destroy humanity because he can't repent at this point. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. Yeah, it's just what, what else does he got? No. Yeah. So... So yeah, so that like I said, there's just some thoughts I was kicking around, but um, that's that's really what I think I have on the devil. So you want to move on to sin now, the kind of the big bad guy, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. We can do sin, and yeah, I'll get into Cain and Abel a little bit. Okay. So I guess then the question um, that would probably be asked: so we, so if the devil's not sin, he's not this force of sin, this power of sin, then what exactly is sin? You know, what is this? Where does this come from? And I think kind of like the devil, as far as an origin for sin, I'm not sure we have that. It's just presented as something that exists. Kind of like, kind of like God, you know, you don't have an origin story there. He's just there. And sin is kind of like that too. It's something that exists. In the first conversation you have between God and Adam, God actually warns Adam about it. And in a sense, I mean, he says, if you eat from this tree, you'll die. He doesn't use the word sin there, but he's warning him that there's, I don't know, what I guess what would what that be is it's a warning that there's there's something, you know, there's something out there. Adam's kind of been put in the way of this. The whole creation is kind of resting in Adam. So maybe it's God kind of giving him a little bit of a commission here, like his 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 duties as the seal and saying, like, this is all immutable except if you partake in this tree. 
Yeah, exactly. I think it it goes along with God giving Adam and Eve the initial priesthood duties of guarding and protecting. Like these are your duties, and that's. I feel like at some point God must have maybe not used the word sin, but said there's something here that you need to watch out for. There's there's a reason that you have to guard. Like why mm -hmm. why would you need to guard and protect unless there's something that you have to guard and protect against? Right, there must be some sort of opposing force out there, because then by the time you get to Cain being, you know, downcast and God warning him about sin, at that point we know what sin is because sin has now happened. So God is using the word sin; it's crouching. And what's interesting is sin is being personified just as the devil is personified. So they may not be the exact same thing, but they're both being equally personified yeah. in that way. Yeah, um, I think so. Believe it or not, the KJV actually gets the um, gets this one really close to the original text because when you see sin, I think it's Genesis. Let me see. I think it's chapter four. The first time it's mentioned. Let me grab it here. So it's that famous line where God says, "You know, sin is crouching at your door, but you, you know, you it its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it." In the original Hebrew text, and the KJV reflects. It actually says, and unto thee will be his desire. Um, uh, some, some regards that I'm not great with Elizabethan English, um, but you must rule over him. Um, and, him, and it's actually using a male verbiage to describe this, this sin who's crouching at the door. So the first appearance of sin in scripture, it's a lot different than the way that we use it. You know, we throw it around in the church where sins are things you do. When God is actually warning Cain about this sin, he's presenting and his sin as something that's I, I almost stopped short of saying alive, but it's a it's a power, it's a force. And the further that this gets personified in scripture, you almost start to think it's alive because Paul even says, sin taking the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covenant and put me to death. So you have sin actually being able to take opportunities. Here, when you have it in Genesis, you have it desiring, it wants something. So there, there's some kind of a, almost, yeah, almost like, I don't know if yeah, personifying, but almost like, living being qualities attributed to it a little bit like it's thinking yeah. you can see yeah uh, it's interesting yeah you said the word desire because i was thinking like in the english Bible, we have the word crouching and the hebrew word for crouching is the same word for a demon crouching that's used in ancient babylonian words which is rob us and it's actually the same word that's used in genesis 49 9 where they're referring to a lion crouching and saying it has the desire for control. So we're seeing this thing that's alive, that appears to be something that thinks, that you know, kind of has that knowledge of, of good and evil, and it has a desire to take control over that which is good and to alter it or unravel this sealed up faith that this humanity would otherwise have in God. I think so. It, and it kind of like the devil in a sense, it's some kind of a force that's opposed to God. But where the devil, you you get like, you can even, I mean, he speaks, you get lines, you get dialogues from him, things like that. You don't get that from sin necessarily. Sin is kind of like the monster in the closet. It's kind of the agent that's controlling all these other like almost satellites, like the devil, the demons, the things like that. It's almost like, it's almost like that. So you don't ever get it where it speaks or things like that. Um, you can't see it, you can't hear it, but you can, you can see its effects. You can feel its effects, which are really... That's really consistent with some kind of a like. It's almost like an anti-Holy Spirit because that's how the Holy Spirit is. You don't you don't see him, you, um, but you can feel his effects. That that kind of a thing. And sin is like that too. I agree with that. As you were speaking, I was actually kind of envisioning like the opposite to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have this sort of like underworld opposition that kind of operates the same way, except with sin, it's. It's almost like it needs to take on a host. Like it is so much like a virus because the way it operates, it feels like it kind of it needs to take on a host and then it travels and then it grows and it keeps sort of festering and manifesting in different ways. Yeah. And and I think that's what ties in so great with the breath of life because we see that's how it actually it's a sin is spiritual. It's not physical. So in by itself, it really can't interact with the physical world. It doesn't seem that sin can manifest a form like the devil can. He could turn into a snake. He turned, I think there's a dragon later on in Revelation, whether or not that's symbolism, I don't know. There might be an actual red dragon at some point. But the devil is actually able to take on some kind of a physical form and interact with the physical world. 
Sin can't seem to do that, so it needs a host in order to seek through. And in that case, it seems like I was saying, it, it's kind of my opinion, but that this devil creature, this serpent, had fallen prey to sin once upon a time, and now he's under the thumb of sin, and sin can now use him to enter this perfect world and speak to this perfect creation. Can't actually do anything because it doesn't have any power over Eve. It doesn't have any power over Adam, not yet. That's coming. Doesn't have any power over this physical creation, but can, through a agent, through a satellite, interact with this physical creation and try to plant those seeds and try to get it, like, essentially infect it, right? Get that infection into this physical creation. Yeah, and I think it's, it's by the time we got to, you know, Cain's generation, now Cain is aware that, that sin exists. It's It was different when they weren't aware of what sin was. And I always think of Paul saying, you know, I would not have known what coveting was if it not had been for the law. But, you know, originally Adam and Eve didn't necessarily know that this was sin that was crouching or, or had this desire to control them. But now we're in Cain's generation and he has the knowledge of good and evil already. He was born with it and he's very much aware. So the way God is posing this to him is you now have to assert some kind of control over this because it's going to get harder and it's going to get bigger because you were born with this now. Like this, this defect is already inside of you. So you're going to have to get on top of this before it gets on top of you, like quite literally, like comparing it to a lion that, that's waiting to pounce at any moment of weakness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. So yeah, so like you were saying, you know, um, that they're, they're already aware of it, you know, come the time of, of Cain and Abel. We've seen like it enter, it infects that breath of life that Adam had in him. Adam gives that to Eve, or rather he already did before sin, but because her life is tethered to his, essentially she has his life, kind of the same as we have Christ's life. When his life became corrupted by byproduct of it being Eve's life, her life became corrupted. And now when every person descending from Adam and Eve receives a little bit of that breath of life, their their human spirit, it comes with sin pre-installed on it. It's that it comes it's an infected life that they're they're being born with. I remember when we were talking earlier this week, we were talking about the church lingo of being born a sinner, which doesn't appear. And then we don't have that. That's not in the New Testament. So I think that uh, with that, I, I tend not to like that terminology also, because I think it, it raises more questions than it answers. And it's, it's easily mocked too by um, by people who don't understand Christianity well. Um, we're saying, you know, you're born a sinner and you know, all these things, mm -hmm. things. It's like one of those, we're just giving them a, an easy way to, criticize us, I think, but more appropriately, what scripture seems to teach is that you're born with sin, not born a sinner, but sin, the infection sin. It's that you, it's, you have a life that's already feeding when you're born because it's that same life from the beginning. So I don't know. I mean, that's, it's, it's one of those things, like I'm, I'm developing that in my head, but I know born a sinner, that, that's kind of what I want to dismiss. Yeah, and I think it's, yeah, I would really like to kind of quash some of that church lingo because I think the thing that gets forgotten is the fact that God made us very good. Like humans were not actually supposed to die. We were supposed to be reconciled and be completely immortal. Like this this was not God's intention, so we have to keep this in mind. Um, I, was, I was looking on threads yesterday and Larry Ice responded to someone, and I always like to read what Larry has to say because it's always great. But someone was calling, we we're born with dirty hearts is what this person said. Like, well, that's that's not right. I mean, we see in Genesis 8, God saying every inclination of the human heart is evil. Well, that's because we're born with a lack of faith, but we have the ability to have faith. Like we have the knowledge of good and evil. We have this heart of stone, but our heart's not dirty. Like that to me, I just don't like that. It goes along too much with it. You're born a sinner. Because that totally negates God's intentions when he made us. God did not make us sinners. He made us very good. And God would not say we're very good if we are not very good. So I don't like that terminology. I think we need to be clear about that. Because if you're saying we have a dirty heart, then our heart just needs to be washed. No, it needs to be circumcised. We have a circumcision of the heart. So yeah, I, I really don't. And you and I were talking when we were brainstorming Jeremiah about whether or not People were called sinners, and I agree. I we're not. I don't like saying we're born sinners. The only thing I could find was Mark two seventeen, where Jesus says, "I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." Mm -hmm. But I don't think 
he's saying there that we were born sinners. I think he, by saying sinners, he means people who have sin because he's using that synonymously um, with Luke 19, 10, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So sinners, it's just, to me, he's using it as people who have sin are synonymous with people who are lost. I don't think he's saying that you are born a sinner or you're born dirty in any way. Yeah. So I, I think it's also, it's so like sin, sins, um, with kind of an S at the end, the actions that I had in humans, they're basically to me, they're symptoms of a greater problem and they, and that they're symptoms of sin, the force living within a person. I know it becomes complicated when we go into the, well, the Christians can still sin. So like, what is that? But, but that's really, I think, so I think the sin is that we see these manifestations of of this force living within a person, kind of like with Cain. So Cain kills his brother. I mean, that's a that's a manifestation of a greater problem. You know, the, him him doing that, taking that life, was a manifestation. Of the fact that he already was controlled by sin. he had sin living within him, as Paul says in 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 Romans seven, of sin is actually indwelling in him now because he didn't do anything to he inherited it from his parents. I mean, he didn't really do anything to invite that sin into him. He was actually, um, he actually inherited that. It came through that, that breath of life. So I think with born a sinner, my big dislike with it is it's not really referring to sin, the force, sin, the power. I think it's referring to sin, the action. And they're saying like, yeah, you're, there's something wrong with you personally when you were born, you, you know, kind of, kind of what you were saying there. And it's, it's, um, I think that's going to be a lot more confusing and what really would set a Christian apart from that then? because Christians still make poor choices and have poor actions and attitudes. So, well, and I guess that's, that actually makes sense. That's why they don't think they're in. That's probably why they think they're sinners because sinner actually means it's what you do. If you, if you make mistakes, if you do something, whenever you're a sinner and they're not, you know, like that, that scripture in Mark that you reference, it's probably Jesus is probably more or less meaning under the powers or that. Right. Yeah. And that original sin, not well they're what they're doing is who they are, so so sinners. You know. I don't know if, if that makes sense, but that's kind of like my thinking on it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, especially in church, we spend a lot of time classifying sins and picking apart individual sins, which is a complete waste of time. But what is interesting is looking at where sin first manifests itself and then how it grows. Like if you look at Cain. We can, we see what the sin is. Okay, he murdered his brother, but where did this start? Well, this started with his lack of faith in the sacrifice. His sacrifice was not pleasing to God the way Abel's sacrifice was. And just in that alone, we can see that Abel was the one who had the faith in the coming Messiah, whereas Cain did not. So you can already see there's been an unraveling of faith in Cain. And this is already starting to kind of brew a little bit and it's getting bigger and bigger and then he starts to kind of, he premeditates things and then, you know, he commits the act and then he continues by lying to God. Like, I'm not my brother's keeper. How would I know where he is kind of thing? And so it's just, it's interesting to see how it forms a trail. It's like a, it's like a chain link, you know, like we can't just pick out murder as the individual sin. We have to look at sort of how it's manifesting along the line. Mm -hmm. I love what you said there. We said something in regard to church spends so much time categorizing sins, which is a complete waste of time. It is a complete waste of time. And that's all we do, which feels like every single sermon somehow spins around that is here's a new sin to avoid. Like stop doing this sin. Stop doing this sin. And it's anything out of faith is sin. I mean, it's that's gonna be a pretty broad spectrum. So so yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, kind of the development of sin. So yeah, like what you're saying with King. Um, segueing with that. I thought your points that you made earlier in the week about the, the coming Messiah and, and linking that to what God had said to Eve in the garden were just so awesome. So, I mean, if you want to share that, I think, I think that's. Oh, yeah. well, I'm so glad you brought that up, Jeremiah. <laughs> so, yeah. Going back to Genesis 3:15, this is the part where God is now he's cursing the serpent. So I'll just read that Genesis three fifteen, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So God is actually giving us the first gospel promise here, even though he's addressing the serpent. So ever since the fall, they've been expecting the Messiah right away. All we know at this point is it's the seed of a woman. So this could be anyone. So in Eve's mind, She's thinking that 
her firstborn is going to be the Messiah. They have every hope in this. Now, in the English Bible, in Genesis 4, when she gives birth to Cain, it says, at least in the NIV, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. But in the Hebrew translation, the way it reads is, I have gotten a man, or I have acquired a man. In the Hebrew word for a man, there is ish slash the Lord Yahweh. So it says, I have acquired a man, Yahweh. So she's thinking that God has brought forth the Messiah who is Cain. And this makes a lot of sense if you look at kind of, you can kind of get a sense of the way Cain was raised. He's the firstborn and she thinks, oh, this is the Redeemer. His name actually means acquisition, whereas Abel's name means nothingness. So right there it goes to show you like which son was the favorite son. So Cain's not really used to rejection. <laughs> so he's kind of, he was, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit pompous, I think, maybe a little bit, maybe this thing manif it manifested right away in how he was raised. Like he was raised to be self-righteous, to think for himself. So it's, it's just interesting how all of this goes so far back to Eve thinking that Cain was going to be the Messiah and the meaning of his name and the way they raised him and him not liking rejection. And then when the ground was cursed, we see the ground being cursed first, and then after Cain sins, now he's the first person who the curse kind of goes into a person now, and he ends up being a wanderer, and then it just grows and grows from there. And by the time we get to the seventh generation of Lamech, he's now boasting about being self-righteous. He's boasting about being vengeful. So it's what I thought about. I think we always consider the coming of the Messiah as being so close to the new new testament like in church it's a new testament thing but no i don't think people really consider the fact that ever since day one we were expecting a redeemer mm -hmm. whether we were wrong or not and at the time we only knew that it was going to be the seed of a woman so i guess why would eve not think that king was going to be the messiah that makes total sense to me i had never thought of that but um when when you were telling me that a couple days ago i was like yeah that makes a ton of sense because she had none of the pieces that come later on in the Old Testament. All she ever had was, you know, there's going to be uh, the, the basic, essentially your seed and the seed of this devil, are, this serpent are going to be enemies, and this serpent is going to strike the heel of your seed, but your seed will crush his head. She probably thought that would have been immediate. That makes total sense to me. So this would have been Cain, um, her first thorn, and then kind of linking that in with the, the Hebrew text really cements that. So... Eve may have even thought that in her lifetime, she was going to see salvation from sin, from this, this power of sin. God was going to raise up this seed of the woman, her offspring, which was going to defeat or somehow undo what happened in the Garden of Eden. So it, I don't know, it just becomes fascinating to me that, yeah, she even names them that way. Like, you know, okay, this is, this is our God. Yeah. And all, what, what's... And it kind of was just, it's, it's sort of with Cain and Abel, it's the inception of so many things because with abel you have the path of faith the path of christ and then with cain you can see how this goes all the way down the line to people who are living by the law who are in slavery it's this sort of master of your own destiny type thing or this self-righteousness so right there it's sort of the inception of of two different paths here going down that line mm -hmm. and what's what's really interesting is one other little tidbit from Enoch too, and then I will talk about Enoch anymore. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's good stuff. In the English Bible, we see that God cursed the ground and God cursed the person. But in Enoch, it says actually that he did not curse the person. He cursed the ignorance, the ignorance of the person, which kind of makes sense as well. Because if we're talking about sin being anything that's moving away from that seal of faith, in God or complete faith in God, it makes sense that God would be cursing the ignorance and not necessarily the person. But I mean, I haven't I haven't necessarily dug into the Hebrew version of that. But in the English Bible, it seems pretty clear that he's cursing the person. But if you look at Enoch, it says, "I didn't curse the person; I cursed the ignorance." So make of that what you will, I guess. Yeah, it could it could be something. I know that. What was it until like was it eighteen sixty five or eighty five something like that? The apocrypha was at least considered to be scripture, and then it was he was kicked at some point, like right in there. Yeah, yeah because I know that the older English Bibles always included the apocrypha. They always would have that in there, and uh, especially the King James version 
always had that included until I wanted, I don't know the exact date, but I think it was the late 1800s that all that was stripped away from it. And they said it was because they wanted to mass produce it and like they're trying to save money on it or I don't know. There's some, there's some silly reason that floats around like that. But, but yeah, I mean, for a long time, you know, the aquifer was considered to be reliable in scripture and it was studied as such too. So I think it's fascinating. I like the connections from Enoch. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's unfortunate that it is split up because I feel like we, we get in, we read through scripture, we read through the Bible and we get this, this complete idea in our head. And then if you start to look at Enoch or some of the other books here in the Apocrypha, you, you think, oh, wait a minute, but, but what if, you know, but you start to see differences. So I really wish it was all together and we were reading it as such because it's, it feels very disjointed this way. Like you think you have an idea and then you read something in Enoch and you're like, oh, maybe it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's they're fascinating. Those other books. I know like Maccabees really fills in a lot of the, the gaps and it's referenced in the New Testament too, like some of the events from those. So, so at least some of this accurate. I don't know if it all is, but at least some of it is. Um, I was going to build out a little bit with the models of Cain and Abel. So you have, you have Cain and uh, Abel is actually interesting because he's the first person that's listed in in all of scripture as being righteous because of his faith and that actually doesn't come in the old testament that we have to fast forward much later on to uh hebrews chapter 11 the famous all of faith but um it's it says this it's hebrews 11 4 and the first person up credited who had their faith credited to them as righteousness is actually able and this is niv it says by faith able brought god a better offering than Cain did by faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. So this author of Hebrews is kind of going back to the very beginning and saying, where did this righteousness by faith truly begin? And he actually, it's so interesting that Adam and Eve are not accounted among the righteous. So whether or not they ever repented from their unbelief, we have no idea if, if that ever happened or not. It's It may not have happened. So, but Abel did. And he's kind of the first forerunner in this righteousness by faith. And what the author of Hebrew do does is he goes through the Old Testament and he grabs a lot of these people. He says they had faith and their faith was credited to him as righteousness. Um, Cain is also mentioned here and not in a good way. They say, you know, he brought the bad offering and he was rejected because he had, it wasn't, essentially it wasn't combined with faith. I don't think it had anything to do with his actual offering. It had everything to do with his unbelief uh, toward, toward God. So... I think that's a little interesting too. There's like, like kind of like what you're saying, Brooke. That's just like the first steps in that. With Cain and Abel. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, speaking of Hebrews, like the blood of Abel, like in uh, in Genesis, there when God says that His blood cries out, like the Hebrew word there is sak s a apostrophe a q, and I know I'm butchering that. And that's just the general Hebrew word for deliverance. So. In Hebrews 12, 24, we see Jesus' blood is a better cry for deliverance than the blood of Abel. It's because we're reconciled to Christ. So Abel was that that first instance of having faith and seeking deliverance. And then this is the step up from that because we're reconciled to Christ. So I just think it's so fascinating how what stemmed out of Cain and Abel was two completely different branches out of that tree basically and it goes so far down the line like it's it's so much more significant than what you were in sunday school <laughs> yeah absolutely the old testament shadows are just like that they're just bigger um a point that you had made brooke a couple days ago that i think was also really good there's a lot you've made a lot of good points but th i think this one was really good too just to demonstrate the power of sin and how it functions so much differently in cain and abel versus adam and eve is that Cain needed no serpent, yes. but he didn't need an outside force to come to him and actually like try to seduce him to commit some kind of wrongdoing. He already had it living within him. So there we go again. So he already had it living within him. There, now no, no serpent was necessary yet. So I don't. I thought that was that was your point. I thought that was so good. Yeah, it is, it is really interesting how it's sort of. I think I called it a bit of a shapeshifter like initially you know there there's nothing for it to latch on to like whatever it is it hasn't latched on to anything yet it's kind of around in the space god hasn't really said what it is but your priestly duties are to guard and protect this sacred space that is the garden of eden and then the serpent gets in there and he finds this 
someone who's vulnerable, this host, and he's like, I can, she can carry this to him. So we have him coming in externally, but then by the time Cain is born, because we know that Cain's already born with the knowledge of good and evil, which comes from the devil, that it's, it's all, it's internal. So now it's an even bigger battle. Eve could have said no to him. She could have, I don't, I don't know what the situation was, but she could have said no to him. But by the time Cain comes along, he's, he's fighting so much more of an internal battle now. It's so much more difficult and it just grows as we go down the generations. Yeah. It's like sin has direct access to him where with Eve, it was an outside force that had to use, it had to use an agent that had already controlled being the serpent to actually even speak with her, even to get any sort of access to her. But, but Cain has sin stirring within him, that, that power that it's, he's got that infected life from Adam. So it's, it's my opinion too, that. I mean, I don't know. This is this is just kind of like observation. I don't know if there's, I don't think there's really scripture that that talks about this. It's just an opinion. But you know, so sin leads to death. We we know that. Um, it death physically, sure, but that's really just a shadow. It leads to actual death, which is the separation from from God. That's actually what God warns Adam about in the garden. Where he says, "If you eat from the tree, you will die." He, he didn't really need a physical death. That's a byproduct of it, sure, but he meant. There will be separation if you if you eat from this tree, and that's that happened immediately. What as soon as Adam did that, it was later that day that this separation um, that we see that that all play out. Adam's physical death didn't happen until like nine hundred years later. So I mean, it wasn't like I don't really think that's what he's talking about. But um, regardless, you know that's that's the warning there. That's what it is with with Cain here. Um, let me back up here for a second. Um, okay, okay. Whoa, I think I lost my train of thought on that. Regardless, regardless, sin leading to death. Um, like, okay, I don't remember what I was saying there. Yeah, so I hate when I do that. <laughs> I'm sure it'll, it'll pop back here in just a sec. Yeah, I think I think the way sin is spoken about, if we can speak about it more as death, um, it would make sense to people. Because I'm thinking of Romans seven eleven, where Paul says, sin became death to me that it might be exposed and attain his character. So it's like sin in and of itself is is that thing that has to catch you. It's the, it's the virus that has to get you that leads to death. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it, it's just inevitable. It's not the same thing, but it's inevitable. If sin catches you, that leads to death. And there's, you know, there's only one way to escape that. But when we talk about... You know, for example, in John, um, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. I think sometimes that even gets confusing for people because they think, well, okay, he's taking sin away, but so is that universalism then? Like, does that mean we're all saved? Like, well, what about people who sin? Like, what do, what do we do with people who still sin, who claim to be in Christ? But I think it would make more sense if we spoke about it more as death. Like, it's not, the he took away the sting of sin sin that is death the sting of sin is death he took that away and we have to think about death beyond the physical body right what does that mean the fact that those of us who are in christ are supernaturally seated with him right now so we have been taken out of death so i think if if we transition a little bit from speaking so much about sin and we speak more about the sin that leads to death and what death is and the fact that it's the sting of sin that leads to death, it it might make a bit more sense. Yeah, so trying to separate sin sin out from like the actions of sin and making it more that but yeah, it's it's really this this death, you know, kind of linking those two in together more or less. Yeah, because I think I mentioned to you earlier in the week, Jeremiah, like I'm it's it's almost to the point of like frustrating. I, I get the question a lot if people are in Christ and they sin, what do we do about their sin? And I specifically get the question a lot, what do we do if someone's gay and they're in Christ? I get that a lot, and I think that's the, that's the wrong thing to be fo focusing on, and it's there's so many points to this, and you made an excellent point earlier in the week that, well, that one's easy to pick on because that's the one you see. You don't necessarily see pride and all of these other things, so we pick on the things that's most visible. Oh, yeah. I mean, we don't see pride. We don't see it. Well, we see it manifested, but we don't see it loss. Um, what about just regular sexual immorality? What about that one? I mean, that's that's rampant in, in the churches. Like, why isn't that also treated the same way? So it's, it's just like, yeah, it kind of 
like what you were saying. It's it's the wrong focus. It's a waste of time to be going yeah. around and pointing out sins. The law points out sins. That's we're not. That's the ministry of death is going around pointing out sins. I think that uh, my response to that. What do we do about sin? So okay, so now we have a Christian that's whatever with sin. Um, I, I I kind of despise a little bit the phraseology "living in sin." Because nobody's living in sin. You're dead in sin. If, you, if you're in sin, you're dead. You're living in Christ. Dead and alive, kind of going back, I guess, a little bit to what I was trying to say earlier, uh, dead and alive it really take, take serious meanings when you get to the New Testament. So you have the physical versions of that. You're either alive like we are right now or you're dead. But there's a spiritual sense to it too. And since God, going back to what we talked about last week, is he's the only giver of life that exists. He's the source of life. All life comes from him. In Christ, who is in the in the Son, who is in the Father, you're alive. But anything apart from that, you're dead. And that is again what God warned Adam about: is in separation. You're going to die because you're going to be you're going to be basically cut off from God, cut off from the source of life. So I don't like living in sin, right? I don't like that because that's completely wrong. And it also kind of going back to a little bit what you were saying there, Brooke. It also tears. It, it makes sins uh, sin be sins be your actions and attitudes. And it doesn't associate sin with death like it should be. This, you know, death from separation from God. But regardless, so okay, so we got a Christian that's committing a sin or or whatever. And what do we do about that? See, my answer to that is nothing because that's not really our job. To me, that's the Holy Spirit's job. And I know that there's some scriptures that talk about different things in the church. And, you know, like somebody that pops into my head about elders sitting, you know, since to reprove them in front of everybody. I get that. I'm not, that's not really something I'm going to do, to be honest. I'm going to leave that to the Holy Spirit and I'm not going to like, you know, be weird about it or judge or be judgmental toward them. I'm just going to understand that that's, that's a sin along with, you know, pick, pick, pick a sin. I mean, there's everybody has some degree of something that they're doing they shouldn't be doing. So I don't know. It's, it's not something I'm really interested in. Like, you know, what are you going to do about that? Or what should you say to that person or anything like that? Just an ambassador for Christ, just just be myself. I don't, know. Yeah. I don't have any game plan with it. Exactly. Yeah. Like God is not going to redeem sin; He's redeeming humanity. So I think it helps to focus on the human and the identity of the human and the heart, rather than. I mean, we can sit here and make a list all day of what sins are, but it's it's not. We're not going to go anywhere with it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think. I think one other point I wanted to make here too is um, sin is not karma. I think sin comes across as sin and karma are not the same thing. And karma is, it's a sort of a new age thing that people speak about. And it's very popular among unbelievers to say karma, to say, you know, what goes around comes around. Like sin is created because, because you did something to someone else. You are now suffering and it's, it's not the same thing. Like, in John 9, Jesus was asked whether a man was blind because of his parents' sin. That would essentially be karma because your parents sinned and now you're suffering for it. And it's it's not that. I feel like that distinction absolutely needs to be made. Like not, not even necessarily in the grace community. I feel like we know that. But that's a really popular belief among unbelievers is that sin is the same thing as karma and it's not. Yeah, we also think God is karma too. You know, if, if you, um, you know, you do good things and now good things are going to happen to you because, you know, God's going to orchestrate all this. So, I mean, that, that, and that is preached everywhere is that somehow you're rewarded for your good behavior group. They call it obedience, but, or, you know, and, and likewise you're punished for disobedience, but that's so popular. That is just cross denominational. It's all Old Testament that they have to go to the Old Testament to get that. I just watched a video this morning about sort of, sort of it's actually on instagram it was um this this young lady has a ministry and she, and she, and she does a lot of really good content and I, I hate to like take on her with this but it was all about lordship salvation and how you need to make god lord of your life and she was like now of course works can't do that she's like the only way that she can make god lord of your life is by surrendering every aspect of your life to him and she's got a list of all the different things you need to surrender none of which appears anywhere in the New Testament, nor does the concept of making God Lord of your life or making Jesus Lord of your life or any of this type of stuff. But it's so, it's just out there. It's just one of those things that's just one of those, you know, teachings that are coming from the pulpit all over the world every Sunday morning. It's, you know, 
is just that extra biblical stuff like that. Yeah. So I don't know. It gets under my skin a little bit. I'm seeing a lot of this stuff on social media where we're completely ignoring scripture and we have these people going and saying, I'm going to show you how to get closer to God. I'm going to show you how to be Jesus number one in your life. And none of it's coming from scripture. Like no one's advising you to read scripture. It's, you know, buy my book or listen to me and I'm going to show you how you can slide in a little bit closer to God because you're not you're not reconciled through the blood of Christ that that's nothing but we're it's a sliding scale and I'm going to teach you how to get closer on the sliding scale yep well and those kind of teachings are well they're they're ignorant for one thing because kind of you go back to what we're talking about what separates you from God is sin and ultimately the death is that separation if Jesus was successful is in removing the sins of the world and there is no separation I think that that so that can be confusing for a lot of people. The Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, taking away all the sins of the world for everyone, believer and unbeliever. I think First John says that in chapter 2. It's something in regard to he is the propitiation for our sins, but not only our sins, also for the sins of the entire world. But whenever we start talking about that, immediately people start screaming universalism. Oh, and everybody's saved. Yeah. Everybody's saved. Well, everybody's forgiven of sin. I mean, sin was taken away. That doesn't mean you're saved because righteousness comes by faith. And that's been attested to since the Old Testament all the way up into, into the New Testament. Righteousness is by faith. Uh, forgiveness is by blood, but righteousness is by faith. So forgiven doesn't equal salvation. And I, I always say this a little bit too. I'm like, you know, big people that are opponents of that, kind of whether they know this or not, they actually teach it. When they, when they are witnessing to somebody and they're saying Jesus died for your sins, they're not saying Jesus is going to die for your sins. They're saying he already has. And since forgiveness comes by the shedding of blood, they're already forgiven. But that's not the, God, that's not the evangelistic appeal. The evangelistic appeal is to believe in Jesus, not, not, you know, do this to be forgiven, I don't think. I think it's more or less looking to the Son and believing them. You're, you know, you're sharing that with them. But I always bring that up because I'm like, even if, even if you don't, necessarily like agree with that 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 this this sacrifice was actually once for all time for everybody the sins of the world taken away to some degree almost everybody teaches it when they when they yeah. preach the gospel yeah i think it's i feel like a lot of people are confused on that and i'm gonna i'm gonna throw john MacArthur under the bus for a second here and i it, i don't believe that he understands what was actually accomplished on the cross because i heard him say in an interview that popped up is he pops up all the time <laughs> on social media that so if people if someone goes to hell are they going to hell be, because of unbelief yes but also because of sin his answer is yes but also because of sin so he's you can tell he's not quite sure what to do with the sin part yet because he's not sure what's actually happening with sin he doesn't understand quite what jesus accomplished on the cross the instructions we have are to look to the son and believe there's not this additional, yeah, but sin. Yeah, but you're also condemned because of sin. No, like if it's it's once for all, it look to the sun and believe. That's the only instruction we have to love and to look to the sun. There's not there's not nothing about okay, all of your sin is held up in this little tank here, and until you believe, we're gonna hold this against you. Like purgatory. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking of here. It's kind of like a purgatory type thing. It's like we're gonna bottle up all of your sin. And until you decide to believe, we're going to continue to hold that against you. So it's not the case, yeah. though. Oh, no, it's, it's true. But part of God's reconciliation of the world through his son was not counting people's sins against him. So, I mean, that that is something that's... I think with a teacher like MacArthur, because I've, I've done a little bit on him myself, I think a teacher like him, pretty much everything he teaches spins around sins, sins the actions and the attitudes and whatever they may be, the manifestations... So if he were to actually say or teach or believe that the Lamb of God was successful in removing sins, you know, once for all time, he wouldn't have a lot left in his arsenal because most of his books, his Bible commentaries and everything is stop sinning. If you could put, if you could sum John MacArthur up in two words, it'd be stop sinning. I mean, that's, that's what he teaches. So I think that's why, you know, oh, do they go to hell because of unbelief or because of sins or, you know, oh, well, it's unbelief, but also sins. Not if Jesus was successful, not as the cross worked, not then, then they're going to, they're not ascending because they've rejected the sacrifices and made on their behalf. You know, the book of Hebrews says, 
it talks about the unbelievers and it says they treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them. They were actually sanctified by the blood of the covenant, but they didn't have no regards for it. It says that they assaulted the spirit of grace and they trampled the Son of God underfoot. So while the sacrifice was provided for them on their behalf by the high priest, they didn't accept that. They rejected it. They, we don't need it. We don't want it. They treated it as unholy. And because of that, now they're not they're not ascending. So I think yeah. a lot of scripture. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely we do. And that just comes to mind. We have scripture that says when Christ returns, he does so without reference to sin. So if an unbeliever was going to be condemned based on their sin, don't you think it would say when Christ returns, he's going to come with reference to the sin of unbelievers? So it's it's either one or the other. If he's returning without reference to sin, then it's without reference to sin. That's off the table. If you're condemned, it's not because of your sin. It's because of your unbelief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's another like really inconvenient passage, the without reference to sin. Yeah, because there's no, this sin issue has been settled. So there's nothing, there's nothing more to do there. The sacrifice has been made. Again, you know, it's it, just one of those things that I think that we we forget about sin, the force, and the power. Sins are what we focus on, is the actions and attitudes. The cross is really of no value. We don't really teach that very well in all. And that's how we get all this doctrine that that is like that. Yes, all about you and what you do. And, you know, it, that's, that's it. So with, with unbelievers, it's going to be... I remember raising this question a while back in a Bible study I was doing. I asked him, you know, I was like, you know, so let's let's throw out Judgment Day. So we got Judgment Day here, and you know, you're standing before the throne. Is the question whether or not you've sinned, and that's and that's what you're going to be judged on because <laughs> it's going to be a bad day for everybody if if that's what it is. Um, you know, believer and unbeliever, that's a bad day if if it's really about did you sin or did you not sin? Because I had I had somebody that was telling me, you know, Judgment Day, you're going to have to answer for every single word you've ever spoken. And Jesus says that in Matthew. That's apart from him, though. That's really how hopeless the situation, the sin problem was, the sin situation was apart from from him, as he's trying to get them into that mindset that they need to be saved. So, and the Jews don't think they need to be saved because they have the law and they're clinging to Moses. But regardless, you know, like, so you're before the throne, if you're going to have to answer for sins, or is it, you're going to be judged on them, then everybody's screwed essentially on this. But, or is it, did you believe in the Son or did you? I mean, I think that's the better better way to look at that. And I think Jesus even teaches that in Matthew, because when he, he's Matthew chapter seven, when he's talking about, well, not everybody that says to me, Lord is going to ascend except those who did the will of my father. He's not judging them based on their sins. It's a, he's judging them based on, did they do the will of the father, which is to believe in him and no, they did not I think he says in another place, I think it's in Matthew as well. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is uh, when he's rebuking the religious leaders, he tells them the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to enter the kingdom of heaven before they are because they believed in him and the Pharisees did it. You know, he's like, so it's, it doesn't matter what they did here, what, whatever the sins were, they believed in me and you didn't. So they're entering and you're not. So I, I think he does teach that in Matthew. I think it just gets glazed over and we, we yeah. like it. Absolutely. And that's the thing is, it's what's so ironic about this whole Sermon on the Mount thing being taught as Christian doctrine is it completely flips upside down the point that Jesus was trying to make. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. When we're talking about sin, the definition of sin being to miss the mark, well, the mark is perfection. That's what he's trying to say. The mark is perfection and you can't do it. So, <laughs> and yet to this day, it's even like, I think I told you my old church spent three months on the Sermon on the Mount as Christian doctrine. I don't know how they stretched it out for three months, but they did it. And it's, all you need is to look at Matthew 5, 48 and see the mark is perfection. So clearly we have all missed the mark. We're not getting any closer to the mark other than one of Christ. Like, that's it. That's all that needs to be said about it. Yeah, but, but but they think that through, you know, doing more stuff, you can get closer to that perfection. And, and I think in a lot of ways, that's just that almost, it, not for, you know, it's got to be careful how I say this, but I think in a lot of ways that actually can be unbelief. It's, it's really not a whole lot different than what the Jews were doing, but they were pursuing yeah. God based on works. The last, uh, like, it's like Romans 9 through 12 talks about the fate of the physical descendants of Abraham. And really the reason that they're not ascending, they're not in crisis because they're pursuing God based on works. And Paul says, well, they're zealous. I can attest for that, but their zeal isn't based on knowledge. Yeah. So I, I, have, I think a little bit and I fear a little bit that that is 
going to be the case for a lot of religious people that do pursue God based on works. It's not about faith. It's I'm going to do all these things to try to get closer to God, try to do whatever. I'm going to try to, you know, in their pursuing them based on works. And they've, if the son of God is kind of taken out of the way at that point, he's kind of set aside and it's all about getting to God based on performance. So I don't know. I, yeah, absolutely. And if we're, if we're going to go to a, a sin focused doctrine, then Jesus doesn't make any sense at all. And we should really go back to an animal sacrifice system in that case, because with the animal sacrifices, we're focusing on our annual sins. It's all about the sinner. So if we want to focus on the sins, then we should just push Jesus out of the way and go back to animal sacrifices because that was the exact purpose for that on the Day of Atonement. It was to focus on what the sinner did. We're supposed to be focusing on what Jesus did now. So if you want to do sin-focused doctrine, then we should probably build a temple and start sacrificing animals again. Yeah, he doesn't. You know, Jesus doesn't make a lot of sense in sin-focused teachings. He well, he doesn't. He doesn't do anything. I think that's like, you know, as far as like the stories about Jesus, okay, sure. But like the functionality of Jesus and his purpose, the purposefulness of Jesus is next to nothing. He doesn't provide any purpose. Eternal life, maybe. Like by believing in him, you, you may go to heaven. I keep seeing, incidentally, um, I don't mean to go off on a trail here. I keep seeing this phrase that I really don't like, and it's uh, get into heaven. I see that all the time in like Christian posts and all these, these online teachings, get into heaven. Yeah. That's not the gospel, like, you know, how to get into heaven. Well, do you know, I don't know. I just, I don't like it because to me that reflects like that they don't really have a lot of understanding. If it's, you know, oh, do this to get into heaven or this is going to get you into hell or whatever. I'm, I don't know. But I, I see that a lot like thrown around, like, like heaven's, I'm kind of an exclusive club and like, you know, God's the bouncer or something. And there's like certain things you have to do to get in. And that's, that's the teaching. So I, I don't know. I don't like it, but I do see it quite a bit. Yeah. It's a shame because it's, it teaches people that there's, there's no power. Jesus has no power here on earth. Like the Holy spirit has no power. It's just, you're stuck in the situation you're in, but hopefully, you know, you'll get to a better place one day. And it's unfortunate because He's got all the power here. Like the Holy Spirit is, once you recognize that identity piece, once you actually know who you are, like it's pretty incredible. So it's unfortunate that people are being taught that you're in the situation you're in and it's not going to change, but hopefully you secured a seat in heaven. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, you know, that reminds me of something else you said earlier this week. You were, you said that the church portrays sin as unescapable. Um, I think it was building off that idea that we were born sinners. It's like, it's almost this unescapable thing then. Yeah. Your, your dirty hearts. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's taught that, I mean, it's certainly not taught the way we're talking about it today as being this force. That's, you know, kind of like a leech, I guess, in a way, or a virus waiting to latch onto you. You're taught that you yourself are evil. You can be slightly less evil. But if you look away from, and I've heard a pastor say this, if you look away from Christ for two seconds, Satan's going to get you because you're just, you're kind of, it's like you're in this melting pot of sin and you can't escape it. And the Holy power, the Holy Spirit certainly has no power mm -hmm. at all. So you better just keep your eyes fixed on Christ, deny yourself because you're completely evil. <laughs> yeah. It, it is so messed. I mean, it's a ministry of death, like to the letter with, yeah. with, I, so I guess that's probably the importance of, you know, what what we're saying this morning, uh, this morning, it's afternoon now, but like what, what we're saying about, um, you know, really f taking the focus off the devil, off of sin and putting it on sin, the, the power, sin, the virus. If, if we're going to talk about sin at all, let's talk about the actual, the the thing, the actual thing sin that, that um, first entered through Adam and now has infected the human race. What's so cool about, the last Adam, though, so you have Christ. So we were talking about a little bit how Adam was this original seal. He's kind of the the um, protector. Actually, Ezekiel 28 refers to him as a guardian cherub who covers. A uh, cherubim in the Old Testament are kind of symbolic with being guardian, like guard, guardian roles or whatever, and God compares, or rather, Ezekiel does, by way of the Holy Spirit, compares Adam to a cherub. In that, saying you covered, you were the protective cover, essentially, over the earth. Um but going through all that, so so we have the last Adam show up, and with Jesus, he he's kind of like he's a new humanity in himself. So he's the the last Adam. He has a source of life which he provides, which is the Holy Spirit. 
And similar to Eve in that sense, so we're now in Christ, we die in Adam, we're reborn in Christ, we're reborn with this Holy Spirit. The breath of life that we had that originally was our spirit is is killed. That's why we get a new spirit. For the Ezekiel, it also says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. We need a new spirit because our old one, this breath of life that we got from Adam that had sin pre-installed in it has now been removed and we've been given the Holy Spirit instead. So we're, we're set apart now from who we used to be. We're set apart from sin. Sin has no dominion over us. It has no functionality with us. And we kind of now become like Eve was when she was an Adam before the fall. So sin can now use outside agents to try to get to us, try to speak to us, but it has no actual power, can't make us do anything, doesn't have any sort of an indwelling presence with us anymore. And for any of that to be corrupted, sin would actually somehow have to get to Christ, just like it got to Adam. It would have to be him. He would have to sin. He would have to succumb to that. And then all of that would flow down to us. But that is the only way that would happen. So yeah, and that, ex that explains perfectly why Jesus was tempted in the way he was, because the devil knew, like, if he could cast just a little bit of seed of doubt in the new divine son of God, then it was going to trickle down to all of us. And everything that Jesus came to do would be completely null and void at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, you, you almost have like a repeat of what happened in the Garden of Eden with the first Adam. You have the other happened in the Gospels. And so now here comes the, the tempter again. And he's going to go after the last Adam, you know, try to do this this thing all over again, basically. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think that makes sense. So like the power of sin does have some functionality still in this world, in the flesh, in the, those who are in Adam, those who have his life every time that somebody is, well, I guess, you know, I, I don't want to say born a sinner, but when, you know, people still are, are receiving that breath of life, the descendants of Adam are, but we are the, you know, we're the children of God. So we're kind of cut off from that. But in the world where Adam's family still lives, they're still of the world. There's still that operation going on, that, that power of sin who still has, has lives within people. It makes sense to me. I think I'm going to flesh it out a little bit more to kind of like separate that a little a little bit more like in you know maybe do some writing on it but like the mechanics of it do make sense I think. yeah absolutely and i think it helps you know when if we're going to talk about you know children of god struggling with sin i think and at least for me like the identity piece was what really clicked with me because if you're taught you're a sinner in church then everything that you do that you you struggle with you know your whatever you miss the mark with in your life or the things that you struggle with it all feels like it's born out of you. It's coming from you and this is who you are. So if people can start to take that out of themselves and think of it as this thing that desires to have the control over you, then you can start to understand, no, it's not me. It's a force that I need to fight against. So I, I have options here. This is not who I am. This is not who God made me to be. So, so much of it is knowing that identity piece. So I think that really helps with all of this when we talk about things that people struggle with after being in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just really good. So sim similar to Cain, but not exactly like Cain. So Cain, God is telling him that, that sin is, is yeah, it's this outside force. For, for Cain, it was an internal thing. So that, I think that would be the difference between Cain and the child of God. But still, it's this force. It's it's not, Cain isn't sin. Sin is something that desires to have him. And it's, it's you know, it's crouching, you know, wanting to, wanting to devour him would be similar, not exact, to a child of God. It would be that, yeah, it's not you, it's there's this force out there, kind of like what you said, and the struggle is really there with this with this outside force. It doesn't change who you are if you were to give in to it, just like it didn't change who Eve was when she gave into it. it. doesn't do that. It's not going to be helpful. It's not good, but it doesn't... It's Your your identity is immutable because it's secured another person who is, who is Christ. So, you know, I think it's good. Yeah, and the biggest consequences I think we are important to remember is it is are the ones on earth. You know, there's consequences for sin on earth. It certainly makes things tough if you're struggling with certain things, but it never changes your position in Christ. So I think that's that's the biggest I think that's one of the biggest takeaways here is it does not change your position in Christ. So don't worry about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm gonna jump to the comments here real quick. So that quarter uh, getting kind of. Was there anything else we needed to um, we needed to add to that though? I think I think we covered pretty much all of it. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we did even beyond what we had planned. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, good morning, Manuel. 
Manuel says myth busting at its best. I think we were talking about the devil fall word yeah. story there. Yeah. yeah, it is a myth. At least most of it. I mean, there's some semblance of like scripture in there, but it's mainly a myth. Manuel says he's amazed at how many people will die on this hill of the Satan story. So was I when I, like I said, I did a video about this last year and I was, I could not believe the pushback that it got. It was, um, you need to read your Bible. The Bible clearly says, and I, I did interact with the comments on this and I said, can you help me? Can, can you help us by providing the scripture where the Bible clearly, you know, lays out this, this devil origin story and, you know, people were just mad about it. They of course didn't provide any. I think one person did, and they said Ezekiel twenty-eight or something like that. And I said I go over that extensively in this video. You know, so please, please watch the video. I, I talk about it quite a bit. But yeah, it was it was just unbelievable. They were they were man, they were ready to fight over the over the devil origin story. By Grace New Covenant it says so. I guess born into the power of sin, born into the slavery of sin before being saved might be might make more sense instead of born sinners i imagine yeah i think, I, yeah, I think that's a better distinction than just simply kind of like finger pointing people you're you're born a sinner it it it's more um i think it's it's more correct to say it that way and that's all kind of how paul says it you're either going to be a slave to one or the other mm -hmm. i think so too in and really highlighting that force of sin, that power of sin, and sin not being the the action, it's the verb of sin, you know, and just, I don't know, I really want to do that a lot more, like reflect a lot more of that in like the content I produce and really just minimize the sins that are the actions and attitudes. And I know that that's like nails on a chalkboard for, for probably religious people here. Oh, you're minimizing sin because that's what we get accused of all the time is you're, you're not making a big deal of sin. It's, it's not that I'm, if I'm going to make a big deal out of sin, it's going to be the actual thing, the, the power of sin, the force of sin. And then I'm going to make a big deal of how Jesus defeated that once for all time, you know, and that's, that's something that's now in, in death, somebody that's a defeated enemy. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a lot about the cross there too, but as far as the actions and attitudes, that's not hugely important to me. Actually, it just isn't. I mean, that's, I, I understand that. It's not unimportant, but it's not a focus. I'm not really going to focus on that. There's plenty of people who do. So I think that if somebody enjoys watching that, pick from the buffet. There's plenty of people who focus on sins. Absolutely. Uh, Manuel says it's also known as generational curses. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, we were talking about how sin is not karma, and karma, yeah, like definitely goes along the line of there's a lot of especially Eastern belief systems and the whole generational curses thing. And I remember you covered this a while ago, didn't you? Generational curses. Yeah, yeah it was, um, I did. I did a live stream on that. I think the whole crux of it, if I have to put it in a nutshell, would be even if all of that were true, which we don't have scripture that necessarily talks about it, we have a little bit in the law that talks about God holding charges um, for like sins throughout a generation. A little bit of that, it's not really a curse, but you have that in the law. But even if all of that were true, you died. So when you died, when you believed in Jesus, you were buried with him, you were raised a new person. So any ties to a previous generation or generational sins or whatever the heck this is, would have died with you. That person is gone, buried, and never going to be seen again. There's That's probably like in a nutshell, I would say about generational curses. Also, it bothers me that the New Testament never speaks it well. I would, I would probably raise that as well and say, well, why... You know, what what's this? Like, if this is really some core doctrine in generational sins, and we need to repent from these, why do we not have a single teaching about anything similar to that anywhere in the New Testament? So, the Old Testament doesn't really do that either. I remember that when I looked into those scriptures that talk about sins being held against, uh, like, third and fourth generation, it's not referred to as a curse, for one thing, and God is actually the agent in this that's, that's facilitating this. But what we know is Jesus removes sins once for all time. So we don't have God doing that anymore. So really, this is it's just an obsolete thing. Like, yeah, it's, it's just something that doesn't exist, quite frankly. Like, <laughs> like generational curses. So I don't know. Is that is is there anything more that like I'm not considering with that, like New Testament or Old Testament? Well, no, because with New Testament, the whole 
the whole thing is, is reconciliation, right? So there, you can't have complete reconciliation in Christ and yet still be attached to some sort of ancestral curse or something like that. That would be completely opposing each other. Yeah, and especially when it's a generational sin, because that's another thing these teachers usually will talk about. And they'll say, you you know, the sins of your ancestors are being held against you, so you have to repent from that. But all well, that would have been removed at the cross. First of all, we have no scripture that says that to us, Gentiles, but all of that would have been removed at the cross anyway. So why are we repenting from that? You know, it's, and, and, by, and incidentally, and this might be a mind-blowing thing for them, that's not how you're forgiven of sin, is, is going and repenting of it you, by blood. So that would be the next thing. <laughs> but yeah, I used to be really into that though. Um, when I was involved in deliverance ministries, I, I mean, I talked all about, about generational curses and all those kind of things. So I, I get it. I know it's, it's popular. It sells. Yeah. I, it's trendy. I, I understand that you can, you can do so much with that. You know, you, you start a ministry telling Christians they can have demonic forces present in their life and all these generational things. You can write books. It's um, people are kind of interested in that element like the demonic and like kind of kind of creepy things like that there's actually a huge interest in that so you know if you write a book about about the new covenant and grace you know there there is an interest in that and but you're going to sell fewer copies than if you write a book about the devil and demons and dark powers and things like that that that's going to be a big hit yeah and it's, especially if you set yourself up as some kind of person who has the answers you know how to get rid of this stuff and, and things like that and that's that's unfortunate that, that's what i did i mean that's that's what i used to do. so i i didn't ever read the scriptures much that was the huge problem there because when you start reading the scriptures you find that this is just not something that's supported in any way shape or form but yeah no, it's true it, it is funny how a lot of times people would rather read extra biblical material than read scripture like there's if you're going to read one thing or the other i don't there seems to be this preference for the extra biblical material i don't really understand that i don't understand that either but i also remember being like that like yeah being in that, I love like, yeah. yeah yeah i look back at that and i'm like why why did i do that like why was i not interested in what the actual scriptures why was i interested in somebody's interpretation of them right I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I definitely remember that. So there is, yeah, the, there's a much greater interest in that. We've really, it's because humans, I think, are just kind of naturally followers of people. And that's, you know, you get you get your favorite teacher in here now. So John MacArthur, you mentioned him earlier, so let's pick on him. Look at his following. But look at how divorced he is from scriptural truth. I mean, so far divorced from it. There's yeah, it's... <laughs> It's insane. Like there, there are multiple groups for him on Facebook that pop up in my newsfeed and there are hundreds of thousands of people in each group. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. In, in with him, it's like there's mixed covenant theology and then there's John MacArthur, who's like, who's like really a much further down that road than a lot of mixed covenant theologians are. Yeah. So absolutely. But, but you know, his teachings and other teachers like him, that passes for wisdom. That it does. It passes for wisdom. This guy's this guy knows his stuff. He's been doing this since like, you know. Um, and yeah, he's written so many books. He has the MacArthur Study Bible. I mean, he's got his, so much stuff. But he, but his his substance that he actually teaches is really really different than what we see in the New Testament. And I think if people read the New Testament, they would know that. But I I feel like again, it's 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 searching that extra biblical content. We're more comfortable with listening to MacArthur or anybody like him, really, then we are actually reading the New Testament. Yeah, I think the church just kind of trains us that way because we get used to the pastor and the pulpit system, so we automatically defer everything through a man, so we feel more comfortable seeking knowledge through a man rather than seeking it through the Holy Spirit and Scripture. I think it's just, we're just indoctrinated with that in society, I think. Well... And the Holy Spirit is, um, you know, the whole thing with that, where he doesn't do anything at all. Talk about how Jesus doesn't do anything in the church gospel. The Holy Spirit really doesn't do anything. Yeah. Like, he is pure symbol of them. I'm sorry, it is pure symbol of them. You know, yeah, yeah, it does absolutely nothing whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. So, and Jesus is right there with him, because Jesus doesn't do much in that gospel either. So, but, but yeah, no, so I, I understand how that could happen. But, yeah, it's it's something. But, all right, so I guess let's jump off here then.
Yeah, not many minutes went by fast. Yeah, <laughs> always does. But all right, guys, well, thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you sharing your comments. Brooke, thank you for uh, sharing, sharing those insights. Like I said, I had never, you had like four or five really good ones there. I had never heard or considered those. And I think that they're, they're all game changers too with the story of Cain and Abel. It's, um, it's kind of funny when we were brainstorming for this, we were going to do Cain and Abel and then the flood, but Brooke had so much good content with Cain and Abel. We were like, there's no way because there's so much here that it, that needs to be its own episode. So I think next week we'll probably talk about the flood. I, I think that's kind of a plan there, but yeah, absolutely. I know we're going to dig up the water about that. So I'm kind of excited for that work. Yeah. The flood is not what it appears. I cannot wait to get into that. There's, there's so many layers to that cake. So that's going to be a, that's going to be a good episode, but all right. Well, thanks guys. And uh, we will see you next week sometime. Hey, thanks guys. Bye.